we are at the disbelief phase and depression phase. Mm -hmm. So this is where people can't believe the markets are rising because they know the economy is getting worse. Okay. Because the economy, what you're looking at is today's data. The macro world lives on forward looking. So you have to live in the future. Mm -hmm. So what is the, so let's ask ourselves a simple question. Okay, there is a recession. We've broken Credit Suisse. We've broken Silicon Valley Bank. There's probably going to be a few more. What is the outcome? The outcome we know is a, with almost 100% certainty is rate cuts. And almost with 100% certainty is more monetary liquidity. Mm -hmm. So therefore, asset prices should start pricing in those things because the biggest driver of returns since 2008, when everything changed, has been the balance sheets of the central banks, liquidity. So if you take, I mean, I use the G5, the balance sheets of the G5. So that's the ECB, the Fed, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, People's Bank of China. You make a composite of that and map the S&P 500 against it. 97.5% mm -hmm. correlation. It's basically wow. the same thing. Now, when you look at that, you realize that now the S&P is basically a voting machine or a probability calculator to when is it coming and how big is it going to be in terms of liquidity. So that's why it's going up. If you think about this, right, what is our job as investors? What are we trying to do? We're trying to deliver to ourselves that vision of our future. Right. Mm -hmm. Investing is about buying assets that you can sell later. So your future, your future self is, is wealthier, better yeah. off. Right. Mm -hmm. And we all have this, we have this vision of where we could be in 20 years time. And it kind of drives us as humans. So therefore assets at the end of that 20 year period or however long, or you're trading in your investment need to be worth more in purchasing power terms and, and simply and... when you step back you know crypto people think it's all about crypto and it's regulators and it's ftx it's not none of that it's liquidity mm -hmm. was taken out of the system yeah, yeah. Indeed. and we've got the asset that that moves most according to liquidity mm -hmm. so when liquidity comes out it falls a lot when liquidity comes in it rises even more because there's yeah. a secular uptrend so how i look at crypto is if you take the log chart of crypto which everybody a uh, bitcoin which everybody's yeah, looking we, we know it yeah you know, you use that and it goes in these big cycles. And those big cycles are the monetary cycles, liquidity cycles. Yeah. But it's still always going up. While if you look at S&P and stuff like that, they don't really do as much of that. So that's the simple way of, of thinking about it. But this chart that you've got on the screen shows you it goes up a lot. So that's where the correlation breaks down. And the reason being is this is driven by what's known as Metcalfe's law. So Metcalfe's law is how to value networks. And mm -hmm. networks are valued by the number of people on the network and the number of connections between them. And cryptocurrency has gone from when I first started looking at maybe a few million people using it. So yeah. now there's 300 million active addresses. Okay. And the next time we get to the next cycle, there'll be a billion. Um, and so that scale of adoption and all the applications being built on it just means it goes up in price a lot because mm -hmm. this is the network of money and value. I mean, that's the, you know, what, what is the total addressable market size of that? We don't know, but it's, if I look at all other asset classes globally, they're worth a hundred to 200 trillion. Mm -hmm. So what is crypto worth in 20 years time? A hundred trillion. So Bitcoin itself, you know, is that pristine asset that nobody can mess with, but it's mm. useless as a transactional currency. Mm -hmm. Now you can use the lightning network, which is using the, the chain itself, but Bitcoin itself is not a transactional currency. So what is it? Well, it feels like it's a decent reserve currency. 
if you think of what happened to Russia, they got shut out of the global financial system. Yeah. Now, every nation understands what that means is if you upset the United States, then you get shut out of the global financial system. So everybody's incentivized to hold other assets. So gold has always been the traditional one, but it's very difficult for central banks to send gold around the world. But Bitcoin seems a reasonable way of, of storing value. Now, it's very volatile. So that is the problem. So you can't have a lot of it because it goes up and down too much. It, you know, bankrupt countries if you're not careful. But yeah. as a reserve asset, I think the sovereign wealth funds will be particularly interested. I think the Middle East, you know, we've seen a lot of interest there because they understand the game as well as the Middle East doesn't want to be beholden just the United States or China or anybody else. So the best way is have some monetary independence. Right now, all of their currencies are pegged to the US dollars. They're the, one of the largest owners of US Treasury bonds. And in exchange, mm -hmm. the US gives them fighter planes. And, you know, there's this whole yeah. petrodollar system that's built around it. And we all know, and particularly you're in Europe, that the use of fossil fuels is going to decline because it's been mandated almost globally. So in which case, places like Saudi Arabia, um, Abu Dhabi, realize that, okay, they need to they need to now think about this future where oil is not the only outcome. So I, they don't have all the cash flows. So they need to rebuild an economy and rebuild what they save. And so that's what I think the best use of Bitcoin remains. It's mm -hmm. like a reserve asset. Um, but Ethereum has got my attention more from that perspective. And that's like that. <laughs> well, because it has a yield. Yeah, and indeed. Yeah. You know, and if you go to any pension fund in Belgium and say, you can have this asset that doesn't pay you a yield, or you can have an asset that performs better than Bitcoin and has a yield, most mm -hmm. people will choose it. Because again, um, the narrative, and this space is so full of narratives, the narrative, and again, I'm, I'm not dissing Bitcoin, but I'm just the narrative of saying, Oh, it's proof of stake, not proof of work. Mm -hmm. right? In Europe, that's pretty powerful because of the, uh, and the green regulations. Then, oh, it gives you a yield. And um, considering Europeans are bond investors, not equity investors, that's great. And it's a technology. It's kind of like the internet of money. Mm -hmm. That's a simple thing to explain to a fund manager. So I've got a technology that has a yield. Um and is um, doesn't affect my ESG mandates. Yeah. So that alone, and then just the amount of activity that's built on top of Ethereum, just makes it, it's hard to see that that wouldn't be easier adopted. I mean, ETH looks very much like a financial system that people know, and there's assets built on top. So, yeah. you know, if you were to, and I did this when I was living in Spain, I switched all of my life savings into dollars in 2014 or something because of what was going on. No, 2012, because of what was going on in Europe. Mm. And I'm like, this is a mess and it's not going to stop. So I switched everything, my whole life savings and started billing global macro investors. So my entire income was now in dollars and I was living in euros. That happens to be a very good bet. It was like a 145 <laughs> against the dollar, kind of like my crypto bet. I went all in. <laughs> but then what I realized is what you do is once you've decided to make that currency investment, you make a decision. Do I buy treasury bonds and get a yield or do I buy assets? So I bought a house mm. um, in the Cayman Islands because it's based in dollars. That is the same as NFTs versus yeah. staking. Mm -hmm. NFT is an asset in that currency. So you buy scarce assets. And now what happens is, is in good economic times, when that economy, that digital economy, ETH, is vibrant and people are making money, well, people go and buy trophy NFTs, for example. Yeah. Like they do trophy real estate or trophy art because it's social signaling. It's a yeah. store of value for you. It's a very yeah. human thing to do. So, yeah, at, at many levels, it works very well. Again, I don't think ETH will be the best performing crypto either because the Metcalfe's law thing is the startup is where you make the most money. But that's the hardest thing to do. Trying to find the, the shit coin that actually really is <laughs> the the opportunity is difficult. Yeah. So I think it becomes much more about luck or you have to be a real insider to understand 
you know, what each protocol is doing and everything else. So I try and generally keep it as simple as possible. Look for network adoption. Where where are people building on top? So you've got things like, so Doge is a really interesting one. So Doge is just one side of Metcalfe's law. There's a bunch of retail owners. Now, there's a lot of them, which is why Doge is valuable. Now, what happens if somebody builds on that network, like Twitter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is the value of Doge? It's a lot. Yeah. If you have a lot of underlying users. Now, they have no use cases right now, apart from speculation. But you give them a use case. Yeah. Okay. That's, that could be a game changer. It may never happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not a particular bet of mine, but it's just something I observe. 